Papa en el ritmo de siete compases. Entonces, si les parece un poco, uh, confu un poco confuso, no es un error. Por ejemplo, es este ritmo. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers. You'll be free. Join us now Come on, you can and collapse. share the software. You'll be free. Who knows who this is? Hackers. You'll be free. Yeah. I'll buy you a beer. That's your gift. Orders can get piles of money. That is true. We won't use any kind of credit card payment system true. either. We use cold hard cash. But they cannot help their neighbors. That's not good. Hackers, that's not good. When we have enough free software at our call, hackers at our Call. We'll kick out those dirty licenses evermore. Hackers ever. All right. There you go. Well, I'm just going to roll with the browser bar at the top because I kind of forgot how to do that. Um, so, anyways, uh, this is my talk. It's a universal JavaScript and bad jokes. At the end, we're going to have an open forum for bad jokes. I hope you have a few ready. Uh, so it's kind of a tradition for me to uh, play the free software song at the beginning of every talk that I give because it makes me feel super uncomfortable and I hope it does you too. Hey, hey, Sam, who are you? Who am I? Yeah. It's the next page. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So, hi, my name's Sam. Uh, I just moved here from Phoenix and uh, I work for a company called uh, iStev. Uh, I've been with them for about four years. Uh, they kind of picked me up off the street while I owned a few coffee shops a few years ago and turned me into those little four things down there. Uh, there's my Twitter, there's my email, shoot me some stuff, do whatever you want. Um, so anyways, quick introduction and uh, kind of why I enjoy this topic a lot. Uh, back when I did own a coffee shop, I opened up a coffee shop across the street from a hacker space called Heatsink Labs in uh, Mesa, Arizona. And uh, I met these four dudes that would come into the coffee shop with these little gizmos and gadgets and gyros and stuff like that. And they'd have blinky lights all the time. And I was like, wow, that's super cool. So uh, they started showing me how to use this crazy thing called Node.js. And uh, I've been kind of a Linux user since the 90s. It just kind of as an end user, always doing code for fun, but never for profit. Well, I started trying to think of ways that I could use the blinky lights and things for profit while I owned a coffee shop. Um, so my talk today is on universal JavaScript isomorphic, if you like to use that term. One of the libraries we're going to be using today or showing off today is isomorphic fetch. Um, I was going to talk next month, and I had this great robotics talk that I was going to give, but uh, it got shortened down to three days this week. So I put this one together really fast. So if I get off topic or if I miss some slides, I'm really sorry. Uh, but let's talk about why universal JavaScript is so good. So uh, one of the biggest things I like about it is uh, the shorter dependencies. Um, I hate projects that have like a million dependencies. I try and keep it as little as possible. Uh, I try and keep it as close to standard library as possible, too. Um, the next thing is, I think it's thoughtful and considerate. Uh, whenever a developer is onboarding onto a project, and let's say you are one of the dreaded elite full stack developers, well, you can use, uh, you can use the uh, modules on both sides of the board. And that's one thing I really enjoy, uh, which plays into why it's good for junior devs. Uh, when I was first starting, uh, all, the, uh, all the universal JavaScript libraries were the ones that I enjoyed using the most, and I found that I gained the most proficiency, and I gained the most knowledge from using. Uh, and they were typically the best written, and I could um, 
read their code and understand how they were working. Um, the next thing is they build robotics libraries, which my company does a lot of IoT with. Uh, so there's a few really cool robotics libraries, such as Johnny5 and Noble. Um, Noble is actually a Bluetooth low energy library that is uh, a available to be used in both the browser and in Node. And uh, surprisingly, my boss today one-upped me by writing a isomorphic library. So a few, uh, well, it wasn't too long ago, uh, something came out where someone decided they were going to hook a Node.js Daydream controller, um, or hook a Daydream controller up to Node.js. So the Daydream controller is the controller used for virtual reality headsets with Google's Daydream. Uh, so this happened. And that is using Node.js operating through Noble uh, to capture everything happening on the controller. So my boss today decided he was going to one-up me, and he browserified that. So here we go. So he's picking the Bluetooth controller and now he's capturing it in the browser. So, uh, kind, of a, kind of a fun little thing, switching back to where we're at over here. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think writing universal JavaScript so good. So good. So, back when I was doing it, uh, I used a fancy little setup. You should never do this. That's soldered wire to a battery that was dead, hopefully. Um, I set up two uh, I had this coffee shop down the street from my coffee shop, and I hated these guys so much. So I wanted to see how much traffic I was getting versus how much traffic they were getting. So I set up a Raspberry Pi with a Bluetooth connector on it that would uh, connect to a um, blue bean. This is, a, this is an Arduino with Bluetooth low energy on it. And I took a piece of trash and two little $1 sensors from China and I started counting how many people walked through his threshold versus how many people walked by his coffee shop. And then I wanted to see how many people were walking by my coffee shop and how many people were passing through my threshold. And so I started doing experiments with A boards, A frames, and different types of signage and different types of uh, interacting with the public to see how I could beat his statistics. Eventually, Someone either stepped on this or stole it or threw it away. I don't know. Rest in peace. It was a fun little project. But uh, I wrote that, and that was kind of my introduction to learning how to code for profit. Uh, come, come a few years down the road, and uh, here we are giving a talk at PDX Node. So um, whenever you are working with your uh, universal versus with a universal app, uh, there's a few things uh, to understand before you begin. Uh, one is, what is Node and what is a browser? Well, Node is a library. It's a module-based library um, language, and it's using basic JavaScript. But there's a few differences. Uh, biggest one for me in the, in the uh, subject that I'm about to talk on is it handles buffers differently. But uh, it also doesn't have a predefined Windows object. So what is the global object in your browser? Window. So if you're making an API call, an XHR, or something like that, you're going to be using window.fetch, which has its own spec, et cetera. Uh, Node doesn't have a DOM. It's, it's headless. So you're using the syntax, but you're missing out on a bunch of it. Um, it's heavily module dependent. Everything we do in Node follows the same excuses of every other languages. It has a standard library of modules that you include into it. Required does not exist. You're just working with a straight standard library pretty much when you're interacting with the DOM API. And uh, <coughs> the browser processes response objects differently. Um, well, they both do. So that's what we're getting ready to talk about. So um, before you actually begin, writing any library that's going to be interacting with both the DOM and Node. Um, understanding the libraries are doing what? 
So a lot of times we'll see something we really like before we start writing our own module or something like that. But we'll see, in my case, it was isomorphic fetch. Um, and I saw that it only had two dependencies. So understanding the limitations of the two dependencies of what I was getting ready to use for my module was very important. Um, and knowing what to look for as far as the known differences and then knowing that there are unknown differences. What's gonna throw type errors and what's gonna stop your um, module calls from being completed? So um, to start off, uh, here is the module that I started writing probably this summer. I just wanted to see if I could write one for funsies, and I did. Um, and uh, it's a wrapper for isomorphic fetch. Isomorphic fetch is a fetch library that returns a promise, which is pretty heavily used throughout the React side of things. And I think request does it too, the request module, for the node side of things as well. But either way, um, I always found that at my company, we were making our API calls with this custom wrapper around fetch. And then I talked to a few buddies from some other companies, and they're like, oh, yeah, we got our own wrapper for that, too. Or else they use this library, uh, but it's only browser-based. Or they use another library, but it's only node-based. So I decided to kind of roll my own. And uh, I did it peer coding with uh, kind of my mentor uh, at the time. And we kind of agreed on kind of how we wanted an API call to go. So um, I had some goals with this. Um, I wanted better error handling. Um, so if I did make a call and it wasn't going to complete, I wanted to know why it didn't complete. I didn't want a type error getting thrown every time I tried to make an API call. Uh, the next thing is. Um, uh, the request API for both the front end and the back end, I wanted to be able to use it in both situations. So if I wanted to make a call out to like the SendGrid API and send an email from Node, right? I can just plug this in and use it. Or if I wanted to use um, this in React to make a call to the API to make another call to another API, I could use this in both situations. Um, I wanted extensibility, so I wanted to be able to extend it in the future. Uh, so I didn't want anything around the core uh, functionality of it to really be inhibitive. Uh, and the next thing is I wanted to return a promise because promises are great, and they were great with async and await. Uh, and I wanted it to be super usable with stuff like React, which is where we're using a majority of our API calls. And the last thing is, is still utilize Fetch's sweet, sweet, easy to use request interface. So I actually did not touch the request interface. I felt like it was sufficient. Um, and here was kind of the base usage. Uh, and everything at my company, we name after ducks. That's why it's called Howard. Um, but we are wrapping what we expect to come out of our API call inside a JSON, and then it's gonna return and parse that JSON for us. But JSON isn't the only thing that can be retrieved from an API. There's a lot of other things, and fetch wasn't handling those for us. What about array buffers? What about form data? Uh, what about some other parts of the response spec? Uh, so I wanted to be able to wrap this super simple API call in a few different methods, and hence, which is where I come in with isomorphic fetch. And there's two dependencies that come with it. There's node fetch for node, and then there's the fetch pony fill on the other side, uh, which really just pulls the spec. And then in this situation, it's pulling node fetch. So <laughs> anyways, the differences are uh, form data in node, which is kind of the linchpin that I'm using here. Um, Form data actually doesn't work in Node. So you're going to get a type error. And everything's going to go poof, blow up on you. So um, one thing I did, uh, well, that was just the, this is actually, I apologize. Uh, this is just the core of the fetch functionality of the app. So as you can see, I'm just using fetch and then options. And then I defaulted whenever there was a body passed, but no, um, no method 
I defaulted that to post because really who uses get with the body? Elasticsearch. Um, but uh, there was handling some differences and this is how I ended up handling them. So like I said, form data with your fetch library. Uh, it doesn't really compute in Node. So you had to find some way to make that fail. And so we just reject our promise with a method not implemented, if that happens. And then with the form data, we return that with res.formData. And uh, that will resolve our prom or that will send our promise back to wherever we requested it from. Um, there's a few other ways. This is kind of like the uh, hard part of this was finding out all the different ways to avoid blowing up and having type errors throughout the whole thing. But there is this one as well. And yeah. So uh, once we had found a way to kind of handle the differences, if you want to follow along in the code base, uh, we just basically built wrappers. So we handled uh, JSON. And then we handled text, and then we handled array buffers. And these are all things that are isomorphic by default, like these uh, array buffers a little bit. Um, but then we get into blob, which is going to throw some errors in some certain situations. And then we're going to get into form data, and then buffers. And then we built those as wrappers with Howard as kind of our default call, which is actually just fetch. I imagine you could actually put those wrappers around many other libraries as well, but. So, moving on, now the fun part. It's like my least favorite fun part. Um, building all the tests. I really enjoy that GIF. So, um, playing kind of off the back of last month, uh, if anybody saw the Mocha talk from last month, um, in this situation I had to test both sides so I used this fancy um, module that had came out over the summer called Mocha Puppeteer, which was using Puppeteer, which is sweet. Has anybody used that yet? It is phenomenal. I really enjoy it. And then I uh, just used fetch mock, and then I used expect because expect really helps with resolving promises with an assertion. And um, here was my typical test harness. Um, and I used something called if is node to skip it. Um, and a lot of times when you're writing these things, the tests take longer than actually writing the library itself. And uh, this if is node was probably the thing that was the hardest for me to understand. Um, I'm not the best programmer in the world. I don't know all the tips and tricks, but I figured them out here. Um, so what we did was we just created a get, and you can see how we make our request, and then we resolve it to data. Um, so if it's Node, I just want to share this, because this is actually pretty cool. Uh, I started off figuring out that if I check process, there will be something there, then it won't error. But if I don't check process and release, it'll type error. Um, but then you have to check process.release.name to equal Node, or else it will type error. And then it will make your tests error, and then you will spend hours trying to figure out why. And then you will just dig through process.release. It was really hard for me to understand, uh, but that's a fun one. If you ever want to skip a situation where modules in Node, use this, please. Oh, that was horrible. Uh, we all have those. All right, so anyways, uh, we had our scripts. With this, Mocha Puppeteer comes with documentation. And um, we just tested it. And here's kind of like where something where I still need help. And uh, one of the fun things about giving talks is that we get to share this with people. And then we get feedback, because you're going to tell me how bad it is after this. So anyways, um, with testing with Node, uh, where it wasn't Node or where it failed, I had my skips in place. And it passed 100%. Uh, this was just with Node. Um, so you can see all the different pieces of the response object that uh, were skipped and form data and blob and 
buffer passes in the next one. So this was using Mocha Puppeteer, using a threadless Chrome or a headless Chrome in order to run through the tests and verify that they were passing. So um, not really a conclusion. I still got a few more points to make. Um, kind of the process that you go through when you're building these uh, is finding what works here but doesn't work there and then finding a way to make them work in a way that is going to be sufficient to meet the needs of your library. Um, so uh, it's also not universal isomorphic JavaScript is also not something that's going to be applicable in every situation. Um, sometimes it won't be necessary at all. But um, where it is, I would highly encourage people to uh, roll your own or just write your own. Part of what makes uh, the ecosystem of Node so great is that everybody's always writing modules. And uh, one of the cool things is, is if you write isomorphically, there's probably a lot of stuff out there that can be reached out and touched at this point that hasn't been touched yet. All right, so with that, uh, I figured I'd make a little bit more filler because I figured I wasn't gonna hit the time limit on this with a open bad joke session. Uh, so does anybody have any good bad jokes? Yes. Now I get And the bartender says, that's why we don't serve time travelers here. What be a pirate's favorite letter? Arr, you'd think so, but a pirate's true love is the C. Oh. That came out pretty good. Okay, yeah, I, I got one about paper, but it's terrible. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm totally not. I spent a lot of my day like trying to do some time filler because I stopped playing video games a while back, reading horrible jokes <laughs> when I would be normally playing video games. Uh, yeah. What do you call a tall pile of cats? A mountain. What happened to the butcher uh, when he backed up into the meat grinder? He uh, got a little behind in his work. Uh, what did one snowman say to the other snowman? What's that? Your balls are uneven. Uh, uh, okay. All right, okay. So we're going to stop here. Uh, so anyways, um, the, a few of the references uh, that I used in this, uh, the videos that I was showing you at the beginning with the Daydream controller that was coming from uh, Noble, which is a Sandeep Mystery, who is a great developer to read anything about or to look at his code. His code is so clean, it's so good. It works beautifully. I met him a couple weekends ago and he's just a good all around developer. Uh, if you can listen to some of his talks, I highly encourage it. Uh, his thought process on working with Node, he's actually, he works for Arduino. So uh, one of his major skill sets is at the hardware level. Um, but his thoughts on using Node and uh, Bluetooth low energy and interacting with the hardware layer is fantastic. Uh, the other things um, is just looking at things like Node Fetch, um, looking at the library. Uh, one of the things that kind of inspired me about this whole talk um, or to make the library in general was uh, I did some weekly knowledge challenges with a uh, intern at my company last year and uh, she asked me what should I learn this week? And I said, go learn the status codes. And so if you start with a topic as broad and as you know, simplistic as status codes, 200, 403, 401, 404, um, there's some joke ones in there too. But um, if you start with that and you start breaking it down and understanding out what's behind a status code, uh, what is the HTTP response? What is the HTTP module? Look at the HTTP modules between the different languages. Uh, you can look at Rubies, you can look at nodes, you can look at all the different responses and see how they differ from language to language. 
And uh, then you start breaking down and having a better understanding of what is happening when you're making a request. And so that was kind of what inspired me to work with a fetch library was I was really interested in uh, responses and requests from my browser or from Node or wherever it was coming from. So with that, um, I will go ahead and conclude. And uh, if you guys have anything to ask me, feel free after the fact. And uh, have a wonderful evening.